Okay, so we're going to cover one trait Punnett squares in this little video. We're going to start with the simplest type of Punnett squares before we move on to more complicated types of inheritance um, in future videos. So I'm going to introduce a lot of terminology in this video uh, to get you started. Um, and if you find this pretty simple, uh, then feel free to move on to more complex videos. When we're doing one trait Punnett squares, we're assuming that those genes are on a homologous pair of chromosomes. So I'm really interested in you guys seeing the connection between the results of meiosis and the Punnett diagrams that we make because uh, the Punnett diagrams are really showing the different ways that gametes might combine. So um, in this case, let's start with an organism who's heterozygous. Um, heterozygous means that you have one of each of the alleles. So I'm showing the B gene here, whatever that might stand for. Um, and to be heterozygous means that you have a dominant allele on one chromosome, the uppercase B, and a uh, recessive allele on the other chromosome, a lowercase b. Uh, and uh, heterozygous would be a genotype, again, what your genes actually are. So in order to figure out what this parent is going to pass on, let's trace the path of meiosis first. I'm afraid I had to re-record this. Uh, the audio dropped that again. OK, so here is uh, the results of interphase copying the DNA. And in meiosis 1, um, we're going to line up the homologous pairs and split them apart. Meiosis 2, split up the sister chromatids. And in each one of those columns there, uh, again, represents a gamete. So uh, what could this parent pass on? They could either pass on a chromosome carrying the dominant allele, or they could pass on a chromosome carrying the recessive allele. So they could really pass on two different gametes. So when I make my Punnett diagram, I, I usually like to show the parents at the top and the sides, and I usually like to write in what my parents are first. So I usually like to write that. That's the original diploid parent. And then below that, I will write the gametes they can make. In this case, the uppercase B and the lowercase B. So let's show that in there, too. Um, so notice that we're not just writing letters on the top and the sides of Punnett squares. Um, a lot of students just think that that's what they're doing. And that works for one trait Punnett squares, but it does not work for uh, more complex problems that we're going to do later. So that big B and little b don't just represent letters. They just represent the gametes that that parent can make. So um, remember that sexual reproduction involves two parents. So let's think about the other parent now. Um, let's say that this other parent is homozygous recessive for this particular gene. Homo is a root word meaning the same. So their genotype, they have the same recessive lowercase allele on both chromosomes of the pair. Um, and what kind of gametes could they make? Well, we're going to go through the same process of meiosis. Um, this would be like early interphase. Here would be where they get copied again. And then in meiosis, they'd actually get packed up. We'd split apart the homologous pairs in meiosis 1, the sister chromatids in meiosis 2. And the only gamete that they can really make is a gamete containing a chromosome with the recessive allele in it. They can only make one gamete. So when I represent them on my Punnett diagram, I'll write in my parent first. But if they can only make one gamete, then I, I only like to show it once. I'm going to write a lowercase b on the top row. And then I'm going to just make a Punnett rectangle in this case. I'm going to show how each gamete might combine. So if big b from the first parent were to combine with that lowercase b, then I would have an offspring who's heterozygous. I would have the offspring uh, big B, little b. And then the other possible combination is that the two lowercase b's combine and make a homozygous recessive offspring. Um, and then I'm done. Um, and I can begin my analysis of, of whatever the question is. Now, um, you can make a Punnett square if you really want to. You could write that lowercase b again. A lot of students do this. Um, but you really get the same results. You would just write in those again. And can you see that you just get the same results? You're just repeating yourself. Two of the four offspring here are heterozygous um, uh, in this example. So here's one that's heterozygous, and here's two that's heterozygous. So you can either say that two of the four of them are heterozygous, or if you were to go back to that simpler Punnett rectangle idea, you see that just one of the two of them are heterozygous. And that's the same thing. 
So personally, I just like to think of what are all the possible gametes that we can make, um, and then just show those. You don't have to repeat yourself necessarily. So I think we're ready to just do a few practice problems to uh, wrap things up here. And um, I'm going to show you two problems. So let's say that we have this problem right here. Uh, we are working with one gene, flower color, with two possible alleles, purple and white. And we're interested in crossing a heterozygous parent with a parent that has white flower color. So I always like to start my Punnett square problems by making a legend. So um, I like to uh, create one letter for what the gene is. Um, and then just have an uppercase version and a lowercase version. Um, some students do two different letters for the recessive and dominant alleles, um, which I would not recommend for when we get to two um, trait Punnett squares. So uh, what letter do we usually pick? It really does not matter to me. The convention is to use the first letter of the dominant trait. So I'm going to use P as my letter here. Um, however, I know sometimes letters look the same, uppercase and lowercase, so I don't really care what letter you pick. Um, some students just like to pick a letter that looks really different. Um, if I have the letter that looks very similar, uppercase and lowercase, I just like to make a dramatic difference to make it really obvious which is which. So I'm just going to use a big P for the purple flower color, and I'm going to use a really little P for white flower color. So now that I've got my legend, even AP students should make legends because sometimes you forget which is which, so write a legend. Um, you're ready to think about what the two alleles are for each of your parents. If one of the plants is heterozygous, remember that that means that they have both different alleles, so big P and little p. Is it wrong to write little p, big P? Not really, but you usually write the dominant letter first. If the other parent has white flowers, the only way they could show that white phenotype is for them to be homozygous recessive in genotype. Um, so they have to be little p, little p. So let's show that cross then. Um, now that I know what my parents are genotypically, big P, little p for one parent, little p, little p for the other parent, um, then I can think about what kind of gametes they can make in meiosis. Um, that one heterozygous parent could either pass on their big P or their little p, whereas the homozygous recessive parent can really only pass on a little p. So what kind of Punnett square diagram do I need to make? I just need to make a one by two diagram here. I'm going to put um, one parent over there that can just make the little p gamete, and I'm going to uh, put the heterozygous parent up here and show both gametes that they can make there, a big and a little. And then I'm just going to show how those gametes can combine in fertilization. You can either make a zygote who is big P, little p, or a zygote who is little p, little p. So um, I didn't ask a question with this particular problem, so you'd have to read the question carefully to see what I'm asking. Um, but I am also interested in practicing what are called phenotype ratios and just multiple ways to represent the results of what you did. So. Um, what's the phenotype ratio here? Um, you have two possible offspring, and you could say that for, um, for the offspring that you can make, one, uh, you'd expect one of the two of them to be purple. Um, you usually show the dominant phenotype first in a ratio. So for every one of them that's purple, you expect one of them to also be white. Um, the big P, little p would be purple. The little p, little p would be white. So um, uh, that's the, the way you'd write the ratio. And remember, what that just means is that you have two possibilities. So you'd expect one of the two of them to be purple, and you'd expect one of the two of them to be white. This is very, very simple here in the early going, but sometimes students get a little confused about what exactly ratios mean, and we're going to do much more complicated ratios here in the future. OK, so we've solved this problem, and we're ready to move on to problem number two. So problem two, what if I have, uh, I'm considering cystic fibrosis, um, a recessive disorder, so not having it would be the dominant allele. And both of my parents are what are called carriers. Carrier is a word meaning that you, you carry the recessive allele, but you don't show having the trait because you have a dominant allele also. So basically carrier means heterozygous. Um, I'm going to use the letter N. I'm just going to say N, big N is not having it, whereas lowercase n is having cystic fibrosis. If both parents are carriers or heterozygous, that means they both have a uppercase allele and a lowercase allele. So I'm crossing these two parents. 
So let's go ahead and show how we might cross those. Let's think about our parents again, and let's think about what kind of gametes they can make in meiosis. They could both pass on their uppercase N or their lowercase N. So I need to make a two by two Punnett square this time to show those two possibilities for each parent. Right, the parents, I always like to do that on the top and the side, show their gametes that they can make, and show how they can cross. I didn't ask a question again in this sample problem, so you'd have to see what it is that I'm asking you. Um, but I'm interested in creating phenotype and genotype ratios again. So phenotype ratio um, would be how many show the dominant phenotype, how many would show not having cystic fibrosis, three of the four of them. Remember that even though these two of them are heterozygous, the fact that they have the recessive allele is, is overshadowed by that dominant allele, which is not having cystic fibrosis. So for every three of them that would not have cystic fibrosis, one of them perhaps would. So again, uh, a way you could translate that, the three to one ratio simply means that three of the four total would not have it, and one of the four of them would show having it. Okay, um, and so that's simply how one trait Punnett squares work. Um, this is a really um, interesting application of the idea of how two parents could not show having something and yet possibly one of the four of their children will. Remember that you don't have four children at a time, so um, each child, what, what these Punnett diagrams really represent are the possibilities for each child um, that is reproduced. So you have a one-fourth chance that each child produced might have cystic fibrosis here. So we'll move on to more difficult Punnett square problems in the future.